It's Nolan. What's going on, beautiful people? It's the kid, Jay Nolan here. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Industry with Jay Nolan, of course. All my insiders, what's happening with y'all? I hope y'all are having a great day, great evening, wherever you are in the world. And if not, I hope it improves soon or gets better tomorrow. Okay. Now, today we're going to be talking about Nelly, right? And of course, Nelly doesn't really make a lot of headlines. He goes out here, does his thing with Ashanti, has his fun, goes on IG Live, does his performances. He's pretty unproblematic for the most part, stays out of the way. Well, he has a new interview that's about to come out on um, on the shop, which of course is LeBron James. I guess you could say podcast where they line, where they hang out in the barbershop, get a haircut, get a lineup or whatever. It's not a lot of haircuts getting dis- disseminated in the shop, but you know, that's the premise of the show. And they have different celebrities that come on the show and talk about their, you know, their background, their accolades, their experiences in the industry, maybe some of the controversies that they address over over the totality of their career. Well, Nelly has an episode that's about to drop where he's featured. And in his segment, he took a, uh, a very interesting take where he says that his era, which is the uh, late 90s to early 2000s, Uh, era of hip hop was the toughest era in hip hop ever. Okay. And he said it very emphatically, very confidently, and I would be inclined to agree. Okay. Now, typically I wouldn't talk about Nelly on my channel because again, he doesn't really put a lot out there for me to talk about, but when it comes to 2000s hip hop and rap, that is my wheelhouse. That is the era that actually influenced me greatly. It's the era that made me want to become an artist and songwriter myself. It's the era that showed me how to do so, how to walk, how to talk, how to dress. All that shit was like imparted in my in, into my psyche because I was an extremely huge hip hop fan. I was listening to Nelly. I was listening to Fabulous. I was listening to DMX. All of these people that were in competition with him at the time. So when he says that this was the toughest era in hip hop ever, again, I have to agree. Some people might even say, you know, the 90s was was tougher than the 2000s. But I would say when it comes to the success that artists were having, the record deals that artists were receiving, the budgets that those artists were receiving at that time. I think it was the toughest because it was the most competitive era that we've seen in hip hop in terms of wanting to be successful, wanting to get out of the ghetto, get out of the hood. And we just started seeing people left and right become, quote unquote, ghetto fabulous, as they were saying on VH1 and MTV at that time. You know, what I mean, that was the era where hip hop took form. And for some people, they would say for the worse. Right. Because it became more about the money. It came it became more about the accolades. It came it became more about the awards, the houses, the MTV Cribs episodes and the culture, the cultural aspect of it kind of dissipated from the 80s and 90s. So I understand the purists that feel that way. They may feel like Rakim, the 80s niggas was was tougher. You know, what I mean, as far as rap wise with the Rakims. The Big Daddy Kanes, the KRS-1s, the Run DMCs, the LL Cool Js. I would say that was the era where it was the most pure. It was the most, you know, untampered with as far as the art form is concerned and the culture and the DJs and the dancing, the B-boys, all of that was still intact. But again, if we're talking about just tough in terms of competition and, and, and in terms of like, again, People having massive success and fighting for that number one spot, I would give it to the 2000s personally. Again, we're we're kind of on the cusp. We're talking 97, 98, up until about 2010. So 90s is partially there, but we're talking about the heels of the 90s, the 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 time right before it ended. So he also talks about uh, the Grammys. He also talks about, you know, representing St. Louis at the at a time where nobody else had really come from there. We didn't know none of those artists. We had never heard nobody come from St. Louis. We had never heard the accent that he brought into the game. Right. So let's get into what Nelly had to say so that we can, you know, try to get some additional context from the horse's mouth. I don't think Nelly looks like a horse, by the way. We just it's a, it's a saying colloquialism. 
the Grammys get it together. When you won all three years, did you used to go, did you used to, go to the show all the time? But first of all, I wasn't even nominated for Best New Artist at the Grammys. Understand that. Country Grammar was five million, and I didn't even get nominated as Best New Artist because my album came out in 2000, so I wasn't even on the ballot. In 2001, the great, talented, well-deserving Miss Alicia Keys won. Right. And she should have won. Yeah. She should have won in 2001. Nelly, coming from the Lou, did you ever have chip on your shoulder because everything was yeah. L.A., New York? Goddamn we always right. talk about that with the Midwest, man. Like, Goddamn right. Yeah? Goddamn right. But you got to understand, my era of music was the toughest era in hip-hop ever. Ever. It's one of those situations to where you 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 would just hope that the Grammys get it together. When you right, when I put out clip. songs, I had to go against DMX, Eminem, Jay Z, Eminem, Lil Wayne, Fifty Cent, Luda. Nah, yeah. all of us are fighting. Yeah, for right. one spot. So in t from two from ninety nine to like two thousand and eight ten. It's the hardest era we ever do to get we right. units in pimp juice and us. <laughs> <laughs> when I put out songs, I had All to right. go against D. So that's the snippet that they've put out from the Nelly interview. The entire interview is not out as of yet. Um, I believe the full version actually drops tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time for my East Coast people. That would be me. It's going to be dropping at noon. So I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, this actual interview with Nelly to see more of his perspective. As y'all heard at the end of that, that was Cedric the Entertainer, who's also from St. Louis, uh, who quoted Jay-Z, the only dudes moving units, M, Pimp, Juice, and us. Of course, M would be Eminem, Pimp, Juice is Nelly. And when he says us, that's Jay-Z talking about his motherfucking self, right? And this is a great conversation. Because when we look at the 2000 era rappers, there's so many hit records that come down the line, the pipeline. I only named a few. But like, let's really dig into who was out in the 2000s era, man, because the list is quite massive. Right. You have Nelly who's in the video, who we're talking about today. You have Outkast, who's still out doing numbers. Um, their album, Love Below, Speaker Box, went mother effing diamond, right? That was a little bit later, but it's still in that time period, because I think that was, what, 2006, 2007? You had Jay-Z, of course. Hell, you had... <laughs> The whole Rockefeller era, they weren't as competitive in the market when it comes to numbers and commercial success, but they were putting numbers on the board as well. And they were just taking up market share with successful albums because even the least successful of those guys were going gold because people were just consumed with hip hop. And another reason why it was so competitive is because... You know, today we look at people talking about platinum, people talking about diamond, people talking about gold singles and stuff like that. That's totally different. In today's era, we're able to listen to music for free. We're able to pay a subscription fee of $10.99 or $15 and have complete access to a, a whole catalog Rolodex of whatever music from Beethoven up to now. And you could just play that shit nonstop. And it's just like nobody has any restrictions on you. Buying music is a very selective process. Most people today are not buying music at all. You go through 12 months of the year and don't buy nobody's music. Let's be honest for the majority of people. Or you might have one or two artists that you support financially. And most likely, if you really want to put money towards them, you probably buy a concert ticket and say, I'm going to show up and, you know, you get the concert ticket, you buy some expensive ass food and drinks there. If that's what you're going to do, you might buy a poster, you might buy t-shirts, etc. But it was nothing like how people were buying music in that 2000s era where lines used to be wrapped around the building at Sam Goody. Some of y'all don't even know what that is. FYE, Virgin Mega Store, right? These places, I mean, if you can imagine, you look, you, you remember... Best Buy sold CDs and DVDs and shit like that. 
that was way already dead by then. But just imagine if you can, because they, they're taking all the physical product and stuff out of Best Buy. But imagine you showing up to Best Buy to go get you a TV and the building is filled up with people trying to buy music, CDs, right? A digital, a, a form of media that we don't even appreciate or have an interest in no more. They stopped putting CD players in cars. They stopped putting them on laptops. Like it's dead in the water, right? If you're buying a CD today, you're essentially doing it because you want to support the artist directly and you want a piece of physical memorabilia just to keep sake, right? You want them to sign it and you just keep it somewhere. But back then, motherfuckers was lining up and then not, not to mention the mom and pop stores on every corner. Everybody had their uh, their favorite mom and pop store that they went to go buy music from and support, right? And if you are an artist yourself, you could literally go up there and talk to the people and say, hey, man, I got a CD. I got a mixtape, man. How can I get my stuff on the shelf and, you know, sell my stuff in here? Having those types of conversations. That was the real independence back in the day. You actually had to leave the house and go talk to a cashier and, hey, man, if I want to if I want to give y'all 100 copies of my album like or my mixtape, how do I go about doing that? And if I sell in here, how do I go about getting the money from you guys, right? Doing a consignment deal. Y'all don't know nothing about that type of shit, man. This is just, it's different. It's different. It required a lot more of you. It, re it required you to have some social skills rather than sending emails, which emails are a skill. But it's just totally different. And I didn't even get through all the other artists. You know what I'm saying? 50 Cent came out in 2003, smashed the game, went diamond. Eminem was out here going diamond, multi-platinum, multi-fucking 20 million records, right? You had... Cameron was out here doing platinum and gold, right? Pinks, pink out, pink outfit, pink uh, minks on, iconic. People are still dressing up like Cameron to this day. You can say what you want. You might not like his podcast. You might not like how boisterous he is. You might feel like he says disrespectful shit. He was a a, a player in that era. Nas, he survived from the late eighties, early nineties into the two thousands era and was selling records, right? That's why he was going back and forth with Jay-Z. That's why it was even a competition for them to have because he was in a conversation, right? You got other people like Fat Joe who wasn't doing massively with his albums. He was still going gold, but he always had platinum singles, always had a single on the radio. And to this day, he still is producing singles that perform well. You know what I'm saying? Not to mention Big Pun. I don't want to be a player no more and all that shit. At the heels of the late 90s going into the 2000s, he was going to be like a, a he was going to exceed. Later on, we had the Lil Wayne era from 2005 up to about shit, 2014, maybe, where he had just like a crazy run. But from 2005 to 2010, like Lil Wayne was really body and shit, doing platinum in a week. You know what I'm saying? Just went crazy. His feature run, his mixtapes, and was still selling records going platinum and platinum and platinum. Not to mention the platinum in his motherfucking mouth. You know what I mean? DMX was going multi-platinum every album. A lot of y'all remember DMX from the latter years of his life, but the glory that DMX was in, you got to understand. I think he went uh, damn near three, four times platinum on his first album, His Dark as Hell is, and Hell is Hot. He came back in the same year and dropped another multi-platinum album. I think that might have went five times platinum, something crazy uh, with Flesh of My Flesh, Blood of My Blood. 99, he came back out with another album that was like three times platinum. 2000, he dropped another motherfucking two, three times platinum album. And we're talking about real sales. These, these CDs were not cheap, right? These CDs was like $15, $20. You had to go to a real spot that was like discounted. You know what I'm saying? You might have to go buy some old shit or buy a damn cassette tape for the cheap version. But you were spending a minimum of $15. It could easily get up to $25. Some of these niggas was dropping double discs. Right? And just think about that. $20 a pop. 
and you sold five million, just think of how much money these people were generating off the albums. It is nothing like that with streaming today. I don't give a fuck who told you different. That shit different. You know what I'm saying? Already said Eminem, Ludacris was going two, three times platinum out the gate, you know what I'm saying, for his first three, four albums. And he was a, you know what I mean? He, had, he was larger than life. He had this big energy, no lotto, had this big energy, had these really outlandish music videos, you know, I'm superimposing himself into the screen, all type of crazy shit, the big stand up shoes. You know what I mean? Missy Elliott was at the top of her game during that time. I mean, we just talked about Missy Elliott because people are sampling her music to this day. People are still trying to catch up to what she had going on between her and Timbaland musically at that time. She was going multi-platinum every time out the gate, doing tours with Beyonce and, and people like that. Like, y'all couldn't even imagine. Just think, man, Missy Elliott and Beyonce on a tour together in 2004, 2005? And y'all want to talk about eras today? Man, don't get me started. Right? You also had people like The Game that came out. And I think he went four times platinum with his first album, The Documentary. He doesn't get a lot of respect today. He's done some questionable shit. His tactics, his ways of trying to promote himself. You know, not the most savory character. But that first album, I think he went five times platinum. Competition was steep. Even niggas like him. We're in the conversation. And today, we don't look at him in that in that way, right? We had people like Red Man, Method Man, the Death Squad. They was dominating on, you know, BET, not necessarily on 106 in Park, but they were dominating on Rap City, the basement. They had presence. They were doing shit, and they were going platinum and gold themselves, right? Twister, 2003, 2004 collaborations with him and Kanye, introducing Kanye into the fold. We can't even forget about Yay. Like, that era was stacked. And that's why today we got so many people that are sampling music, trying to recreate those songs from that time period. Those samples end up falling flat. They end up sounding stale, especially for people that live through those times. It's like, bro, what the hell are y'all doing? The music, it was still pure. It was fun, right? It was different different sections in hip-hop. So you could literally, there was like, what I, what I miss about hip-hop is the subgenres. You could literally listen to certain labels or certain, you know, niches in the game. And you might not even be aware or care about the Jay-Z's and all of these people, right? You could listen to Twister if you was a Midwest fan and that would come with the Crucial Conflicts and the Bone Thugs and Harmony and Spice One and all of those different people. Y'all probably don't even know who the fuck I'm talking about. But it just continues to go down a rabbit hole and people literally lived in that that bracket and didn't care about what other people had going on. Same thing for like, if you was from Atlanta, you could be listening to Outkast, Goody Mob, Young Bloods, early Young Bloods, especially, um, Yin Yang Twins. Um, then you started getting into other artists, you know, Soulja Boy who came out from Atlanta and different offshoots of, of what that was and the Franchise Boys and D4L and the whole uh, So So Deaf movement, of course. You could you could easily get swept into whatever that was. Gucci coming in Atlanta, uh, Jeezy, T.I., Bone Crusher. That was an era within itself. And you could literally sustain yourself like that's all I'm listening to. I don't care about nobody else. West Coast had the same thing. New York had the same thing. It was it was <laughs> I'm sure the people that lived through it, especially the artists, they never thought it would end. You know what I'm saying? People like Exhibit were going platinum. At the time, who would ever think that? Right. You got the introduction of Rick Ross around 0506. Push it to the limit. You know what I'm saying? He's still around today out here with a, in a, a massive home off of his success from that time period. You had people like Jada Kiss, not even in the conversation of being the top rapper. But a lot of people call him top five dead or alive just based off of talent and presence and versatility. Right. You had Dr. Dre. With his resurgence and his heyday with the whole aftermath shit. Like, it's so many people that we could name. That era was crazy. Juvenile, the whole cash money. Then you had the whole no limit thing. 
right? So you could just basically take your pick. Ja Rule was in the conversation. He was one of the top niggas. Just imagine, yo. Ja Rule gets treated like the motherfucking redheaded stepchild of hip hop. Ever since 50 Cent came out and made it uncool to like that nigga, Ja Rule was on a crazy ass run. He was like one of the one of the top three rappers for four years. By the time 50 Cent came out and he said, nah, y'all can't fuck with him no more if y'all want to fuck with me. And it was what it was. Niggas made their decision. You had artists like Eve that was out here doing numbers on her own. She was busting ass in the female rap category. You had Lil' Kim, Foxy Brown. You know, they were coming from the 90s, but they were still moving units, having influential moments, uh, iconic uh, fashion situation. You know what I'm saying? Like... People today are are now we got Ice Spice naming her album Y Two K because you know when she she comes out she's doing jean dresses and crop tops and stuff looking like you know that time period everybody's trying to recreate it because it was it was a it was a golden era we didn't really appreciate it to the fur furthest extent that we could at the time but shit was happening shit was popping right even Diddy got damn nasty ass you know what I'm saying with all of the shit that he got going on. He was going multi-platinum signing artists going that were doing numbers. Right? It was just too much success going on. Snoop was busting ass going platinum, platinum, platinum. And he he had been in the game since 92. Look at all the bullshit he been through. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Buster Rhymes was a was a top candidate. He was never the top guy, but he was always in that discussion. You know what I mean? Again, another artist that was just larger than life, always busting, always in the camera, face, eyes all up in the shit. You know what I mean? Just a character. So, yes, I agree with Nelly. His era, the 2000s era of hip hop is the toughest ever. I just named maybe like 40 people that were all going platinum and gold, all having successful singles, just a variety of different things that were going on success wise. I mean, they were on TV every day. Just imagine today. We don't have music video shows. We don't have TRL. We don't have 106 in park. We don't have rap city, the basement. We don't have none of that type of stuff, but we used to tune into these things daily, every day. Just imagine every day you came home from school, work, whatever it was. And you knew I'm tuning in to this shit today to see what y'all talking about. This countdown better be accurate or I'm going to be pissed off. That number one video, we tuned in to see what the new video of the day, the new joint of the day. Nigga, that was prime real estate. That was a way to break an artist, break a new single. If niggas wasn't feeling that shit when it dropped, your ass was grass. Your label might cancel your budget. Artists today don't have that type of pressure. They got a different type of pressure on them, but it ain't like that. A lot of motherfucking careers got pushed back off that shit. Mims. <laughs> right? Lil B, chicken noodle soup. Like, a lot of careers got pushed back. So, I completely agree with, with Nelly. I could sit here all day and night and just reminisce on that era. I would make a goddamn three-hour video just talking about all the shit that I used to listen to. But, I'm going to go ahead and just... Reel it in, compose myself, you know, I'm oozing nostalgia and throwback energy right now. Some of y'all may be too young to really know everything that I'm talking about, but enjoy the history lesson. And you should go look up some of those artists if you don't know who I'm talking about and just press play and see what history sounds like. See what type of creativity they was on. Listen to the art of creating an album top to bottom that people listened to all 18 songs and felt like, damn, I know this person. I know what you've been through or the way you crafted this or the beats in the production. Like we just paid attention on a different level, man. It wasn't these weak ass EPs. It wasn't these weak ass albums where they're putting out 18 song albums and you only care about three songs. Now, this was the era. This was like the beginning where shit started going a little left. You know, around 2009, 2010, it was like, man, what the fuck am I even buying these albums for? That's why piracy started going so crazy. But again, I could make a whole ass documentary just sitting here <laughs> talking about this. 
Uh, let me know what y'all think of all this down below in the comments. Let me know if you agree with Nelly, if you understand where he's coming from, if you're from the era, if you are alive during that time period. And I'm not just talking about you was born. I'm talking about actually living during that time period and remember what it is. Tell me some of your, your favorite moments in hip hop and R&B in the comments. Let's have a dope conversation in the comments about, you know, the nostalgia and just the way music and entertainment was constructed for us to just consume and be fucking in bliss as kids. You know what I'm saying? Let's talk about that. Let's talk, let's get away from some of the drama, some of the bullshit and talk about something that just will probably never be duplicated. All right. If this is your first time seeing me on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Hit the post notification bell. Be sure to like and share this video. I will see you all on the next one. Much love and respect. Y'all have a great evening. Peace. King of my city in Codesac. Coming out swinging like soldier rags. Leading my people like quarterback. Boy, I study this shit. I'm an almanac. Had to get up and grind. Knowledge is booming. I'm here to apply. Came with the chip and the dip. It just single the mind. We finna do more to survive. I need my check. Spinning the block for the Gouda. We hitting the jeweler to flood out the net. We don't do beef on computers, I'm straight out the sewer, we come when you rest yeah. Niggas be looking perplexed, so keeping my foot on their neck uh -huh. No map, I trust my gut for the quest, with drama I'm fully oppressed yeah. I was ready for years and they died of me, uh -huh. all of a sudden they tell me they proud of me I have been dropping these haters like calories, uh -huh. cross my mind I came back with some batteries Stand for my honor, but you run no gunner, packing a stick with a drummer Wanna catch my bad one fumble, I done came too far to be humble